I'm, now it's on. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Just waiting for everyone to come in and take their seats. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the most exciting um, part of the session for, for today, which is going to be this closing panel debate on alternative development pathways for Africa. Are we talking about growth, green growth? Are we talking about degrowth, post-growth narratives? We have an absolutely stellar panel with us today who are going to give us a set of provocations, their perspectives on what these kinds of trajectories could be. And then we're going to be chairing this panel, so please wish me luck because I have some really fiery panelists that are going to be presenting today. Um, so to start off, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Neva Mechetla, um, who's been senior economist at the Trade and Industrial Policy um, Strategies at TIPS um, since November 2015. She was Deputy Director General for Economic Policy in the Economic Development P Department from 2010 to 2015. And before joining EDD, she worked at the Presidency, the DBSA, and Kasatu. And prior to 1994, she's worked in various universities across Africa and in the United States. She's currently a member of the National Minimum Wage Commission and her research and publication center on industrial policy and value chain analysis. Um, so Neva, please, over to you. Okay, so um, this is working. I right? think yep. we need to swap mics. Yep. Are we good? Okay. Um, so the question is posed to, are we talking about green growth or no growth or what, do we, what is the way forward for Africa? And I think from a policy perspective, you know, it's clear there's a link between economic growth and environmental disaster one way or the other. But if we want to actually come up with policies and strategies to address it, we need to understand, firstly, what is that link between the environment and growth? And secondly, why do we care about growth at all? And I think that depends, you know, we really have to say who loses and who wins. Because one thing in economics, there's always winners and losers. I'm we're kidding ourselves if we think there's any policy that help benefits everybody. So if we look at growth in the environment, and I have five minutes, so I'm going to be very brief on each of these. Um, you know, we all know it depends very heavily on the type of growth. Um, and particularly, the imperative for growth is, is somewhat less with the population growth falling around the world. Um, and we can envision nearly entirely clean growth in terms of emissions and pollution. I'm not sure we can think of entirely green growth in terms of not disrupting natural areas. And I think so, I have to say, we when we do industrial policy, we're mostly these days thinking about emissions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm quite ignorant on the subject of natural areas, but you can see that just putting in roads and infrastructure in poor areas, which we don't think about as growth in the normal sense, can be disruptive for natural areas. And that poses a problem. I mean, I think particularly in South Africa, given the fact that historically there was underinvestment in historic labor sending areas, where around a quarter of the population still lives, and those are therefore the areas that are most natural, we, e we end up with a paradox where we say we can't put infrastructure into those areas because we want to protect them, but the living conditions in those areas then remain depressed. And you know, I always say you can build a road anywhere in Gauteng if you want, but when we tried to build a road to link um, KZN in the Eastern Cape, it was too bad for the environment, and so we never did. So how do you make that a fair outcome? And even in terms of pollution, you know, there are costs um, in terms of the transition to green growth. We have sunk investments in old technology. We have to pay for new technologies. And generally, it's very disruptive of government and private sector systems. So it's, as we can see now with electricity, even though it's clear that the coal electricity system in South Africa is in itself preventing growth at this point, dealing with that process of change turns out to be tremendously difficult. And they've turned off the clock, by the way. So if I go over, you'll have to tell me. Um, and I do think in South Africa, the extraordinary importance of coal in the economy, I mean, it's, it's in many ways the bedrock of the South African economy. For electricity, for Sasol in particular, it's also a major export. 
and yet it's not destructive of growth. And how do we think about that when we pose this problem? Because we tend to make it seem like, you know, a clean economy will be a slower growing economy. From the standpoint of emissions, a clean economy should be a faster growing economy in the case of South Africa. But that's also why, because South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world, we have to talk about a just transition and how do you ensure that, you know, rich people, when there's that kind of change, they can find alternatives, they can disinvest and go elsewhere, but poor people and working people don't have the resources to be resilient. So one has to help deal with that. And then briefly, I don't know how many minutes I'm on. Two more minutes, okay. Just to talk about growth, you know, the problem with growth in South Africa being a very unequal society, um, the benefits of growth are very unequally spread. And so one of the big debates, as you all know better than me, is this issue of how do we think about that issue of what causes mass poverty, and if we stop growth, can we actually deal with poverty, or even if we slow it down? But even then, it's clear that the problem is inequality as much as it is growth. So for at least 30 years, we've been talking about what should come first, growth or redistribution. Um, but if we're talking about protecting the planet, I think we have to be much more serious about redistribution. Um, you know, but in practice, obviously, there's always a combination. But I just want to say that I think if we're serious about coming up with an environmentally sound growth path, it has to be more equitable because otherwise you end up having to grow so much and you also end up with continuous conflict and contestation over what to do to protect the economy and how much to spend on that. And yeah, so, and I think that the critical thing is to say what causes inequality to persist in a democracy like South Africa and really, I would argue it's because it's the way apartheid shaped access to education, ownership, workplace organization in the sense of um, the level of skills required and career pathing and location, again, because so many people were pushed away from economic opportunities. And we need to talk about how can we st change those things, which is very disruptive and very hard. Mm -hmm. So just to, to conclude, I think, you know, it's easy to sloganize when you're sitting up here these things are really hard to do because if we're serious about sustainable as well as equitable growth, it means changing every aspect of the economy but also society in a whole variety of ways. Um, and, but what we can't do is say to the majority, you have to sacrifice um, for the good of the environment because in a democracy also it doesn't work. They also have to see the benefits and they can't, it can't always be the environment as a way of saying, no, you can't have what other people have. Um, and so the question I would have really just very specific if we were going to have a discussion, I hope I'll be here for it, um, which is how can we manage conservation so that it doesn't perpetuate underdevelopment in historic labor sending areas of South Africa? What would that actually look like? No? Um, so that people actually can enjoy some of the comforts the rest of us have in terms of infrastructure and some of the opportunities and yet try and sustain biodiversity. So thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Neva. And I think that is a question that we're looking at this <coughs> conservation versus development dichotomy. We're actually looking in South Africa as a highly unequal society, almost perpetuating the sort of the, the global north-south inequalities um, that, that we think about when we're talking about degrowth, the need for actually consumption of fewer resources by some, but actually the access to resources for those who aren't actually able to, to have um, their, their needs met in a, in a sustainable and equitable way, and, and bringing in very real lessons for us from the just transition sort of idea which focuses on energy, but again that singular metric of carbon emissions, right, what is the impact on that for, from natural resources? We know that uh, for example, the, um, the transition towards electric vehicles overseas has very real implications for mining of lithium in, in Chile, cobalt in, um, um, in, in the Congo, for example. So a lot of really interesting points that you've brought up there. I'm now going to hand over to our second speaker, Awande Butelezi, um, who's a researcher at COPAC and coordinator of the Climate Justice Deal Research Project. And he's also an activist with the Climate Justice Charter Movement. Awanda, your thoughts, please. Thank you. Um, so I believe this conversation is one of the most defining conversations of our time. Um, if there is a future for humanity and our civilization, we will look back at these kind of conversations with regards to how did we get to where we're eventually heading towards. And the context with which we're living in of the climate crisis, um, particularly 
I, I'd like to think or, or to begin with the 2018 IPCC report because I think as a document, it's probably one of the most prescient um, and clear with regards to the crisis that we're living with. Uh, and in that report, they speak about uh, trying to limit heating at 1.5 degrees by 2030. And that if we were to go beyond 1.5 degrees, the impacts, um, environmental, social, at the level at which we'll, we'll face, uh, will have far-reaching um, consequences for societies across the world. And that for us to limit heating at 1.5 degrees requires nothing less than widespread and fundamental changes to how our societies are organized. We're also living through a sixth mass extinction event. And when we take all these things into context, within the Southern Africa um, context also, our region of the world is also a climate hotspot, uh, and we're also heating at twice the global average. So a 1.5 degrees uh, limit is a three degrees limit in the South African context. context sorry. And our environment and our society is particularly vulnerable, as the previous speaker spoke with regards to the structural inequality that we face and the levels of poverty within this region more broadly. So our challenge is a very steep challenge. Um, and this requires uh, new political and economic approaches that meet the needs and the scale of the challenge that we're facing. And what this means for me, is that it requires a socio-ecological transformation in, with regards to how a society is structured. So I'm going to pick on South Africa as an example because I'm from South Africa and I live in South Africa, um, but it's by no means an outlier in this regard. But our approaches to the problem at this level where we are right now uh, do far too little with regards to the scale of the challenge that we're facing. Um, the Presidential Climate Commission's framework, which it recently released, affirms a two, uh, 2050 target date. And for me, this shows that we're doing far too little and we're thinking far too um, constraints with regards to how we are facing this crisis. I believe these 2050 net zero targets also uh, are an affirmation of a techno uh, optimism that there are solutions which will save us from where we are heading to right now that have yet to be created. But there are also avenues through which we can deal um, with the crisis at hand uh, whilst also minimizing the impacts to our societies and particularly a society as vulnerable as ours. Um, also, when you think with regards to the level of state planning which will be required to deal with not only the impacts but the level of adaptation and mitigation required for the crisis at hand. Governments around the world, and our government in particular, has to think at a level of a wartime government. We have to be brave and we have to be expansive in the way in which we're fundamentally dealing with the crisis. Today, this year, funnily enough, is the 50th anniversary of the Limits to Growth uh, report which was released by the Club of, Club of Rome. And in this limits to growth uh, report, uh, they modeled 12 economic trends and their environmental consequences. Uh, and they'd focused on five growth factors, which were population, industrialization, pollution, uh, food production, and uh, consumption of non-renewable resources. And in this report in 1972, um, the trends, in, in present trends or trends at that time were to continue. They would lead to a sudden and uncontrollable drop in population and industrial capacity um, by the end of the century. But there are also possibilities with altering trends to establish a condition of ecological stability on a planetary scale, creating a sustainable uh, environment far into the future and that is within our planetary limits. Um, obviously, there are critiques to this document with regards to its failure to recognize capitalism as the underlying socio-economic system which underpins uh, the whole context of growth and why growth is such a factor in the way in which we uh, operate and, and manage our economies. Um, and also, its uh, limitations in dealing with carbon dioxide buildup, but not the wider context of climate change. But the general message within this document still is consistent with the latest science that runaway warming has dire consequences for this planet or human civilization uh, more plainly. So we need to push for a sustainable state of global equilibrium, and that requires a socio-ecological transformation, one which is based on a plurivision, 
of taking different alternatives across the different sectors of our economy uh, and finding ways to manage and orient to them to meet the needs of uh, redistribution, as the previous speaker put forward, but also meeting the challenge of uh, biodiversity loss and uh, potential runaway warming. We must go beyond mainstream economics. The concept of a just transition, which has entered into the mainstream, what is a just transition trying to achieve in the broad sense? What are we transitioning to? And I put forward the concept of a deep just transition, one which promotes uh, the inherent value of all human and non-human life, but also which seeks to transform our society and our socioeconomic structures in a way which deals fundamentally with that question, but also does not treat human and non-human life uh, as a mere uh, tool for uh, maximizing utility for human benefits. I'll concede there. Great. Thank you so much, Rwanda. And, and I mean, you brought up this aspect of value, human and the non-human. I think we're moving into sort of a, a much more radical space there. But I mean, Neva, you were mentioning the fundamental transformations in how our economies and societies are organized. And I wonder, you were mentioning deep social ecological transformations that we need. And I'd really love to talk a little bit more later on on what these actually look like. Where is it that we, we could be going? I also want to push you a little bit more on the activist food sovereignty side, so that's going to, going to come in next. But I'm now going to hand over to Jonathan Oppenheimer, who's a South African businessman and social impact investor. As executive chairman of Oppenheimer Generations, he's actively involved in all aspects of the family's private, commercial, and thought leadership activities, including Oppenheimer um, Generations Research and Conservation. In January 2018, he joined the Board of Trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, um, which is the oldest international affairs think tank in the United States, and he's committed to advancing the cause of peace through its global network of policy research centers. Jonathan, over to you. I mean, a hell of a lot has been said, and it's all on point. I, I, I come at it from a slightly different perspective, perhaps because I'm an, a capital allocator and trying to make money as well as uh, try to have a, a, a generational impact. And so there, there are some sort of overarching themes which I think play exactly into what's just been said before. And at the core of those is this idea that this explosion of humanity is, is creating a sea of humanity that washes over the world at large, and we are the oceans, and the nature of oceans is they're incredibly corrosive. They, they are the most powerful force that has ever existed on this planet, and they have shaped the world that we know, and we as human beings are now that force, and what we are doing, sadly, is we are eroding what little wilderness still remains. And so trying to think about how you stop the ocean and statements like King Canute standing in front of the ocean and saying go back thinking he was a god proved to be somewhat ambitious. I think by contrast we really need to uh, bring our collective minds to bear on how we recognize the wildernesses that exist, how we recognize the diversity we have and how we go about preserving that and at the same time, recognize that to do that, we have to understand the ocean. We have to understand humanity. And, and Neva, your point about uh, recognizing and uplifting everybody is absolutely central to that. And so we, we, we reach towards trying to, to find what I call the simultaneous equation of sustainability. The one is critically preserving the biodiversity we have. Uh, and the ecological environment that is planet Earth. And to do that, we have to very carefully and very consciously uh, use the resources available to us because we are, by our very nature, consumptive. Every living animal is consumptive. But in the same way as you're consumptive, you're also additive and creative. And so we need to consume the biodiversity and the ecology of this world in a way that is replaceable and, and sustainable. And so for that side of the simultaneous equation, I talk about consuming our environment at a rate less than the self-healing rate of the, 
the living organism that is our world. On the other hand, on the other side of that same simultaneous equation is, is humanity. And I would uh, suggest that if you thought about your lives getting worse, your willingness to play by any rules set by others would be very low. By contrast, if your lives were improving, you would believe that those rules were to your benefit and you would play by them. And the reality of mankind is we are survivalists and we are determined to protect and prosper in our own rights. And we as human beings will continually strive to that. And the vast majority of people in the world today are effectively calorie deficient and are fighting to meet a calorific need every single day. And if we don't create a path to an easier calorific sustainability and beyond calorific sustainability to the greater sustainability of well-being all the way to the more esoteric, we will create social unrest in this planet which will threaten a human extinction event. And we're seeing it in the challenge of Ukraine. We're seeing it in the challenge of how China is pursuing its zero COVID strategy. And we're seeing it in the crisis in the economy today. And so we have to find this very, very delicate balance between, on the one hand, walking uh, uh, use of our environment in a way that is sustainable for not only ourselves but future generations and ideally is, is creating the space for regeneration and at the same time create a path uh, for well-being in the general population. If we fail to do that, one or other or both of those crises will kill us. So the challenge here is we can't afford not to create additional goods and good at identifying the problem. And I'm going to use some rotten language here. We're shit at thinking about new solutions. You guys, us on the panel, we have to get out of the box, doing what we did before with the expectation of a different outcome is the definition of insanity. I think that was Einstein. We're very, very good at analyzing what we've got and saying we're going to just do it 5% harder and it'll be okay. 5% harder will not save us. We need to do things differently. And for me, the enormous challenge is how do you move from what I call a gray energy ecosystem, which we live in today, to a green energy ecosystem, which creates the space so that we can have more for mankind and at the same time touch our environment more gently. And Nikki used the expression earlier, which was my mother's, that you have to garden with your fingertips. But your fingertips can be incredibly strong when they need to be. You only need to think about a mountain climber hanging on by his fingertip and pulling himself up. But at the same time, you have to have the touch to know that if your fingertip is slipping, you need to do something different and using your whole hand is not going to help you in that. So we need real innovative ideas to create the space to both create more for mankind and touch the world more gently. Perfect, thank you so much, Jonathan. I think that that Einstein quote is exactly sort of the crisis we face. And I think particularly in the discipline of economics that keeps on using the same tool and expecting a different outcome, right? And we need to really wake up to that. Um, but you also sort of brought in this notion of the Anthropocene, right? That humans have become this dominant force of change on the planet. And, and how do we, we reconfigure that tide, right? Into a notion that is still coming at us, but in a different kind of way. Um, and you were also mentioning sort of planetary boundaries and this idea of donut economics. Um, you know, when it comes to hard numbers, the Earth Commission um, is finalizing the report coming out next year, but we've got a paper that, that's due very soon, which was talking about the only way that we're going to stay within a safe operating space, sort of within planetary boundaries, and meet the basic needs of everyone, whether we're looking at food, we're looking at water, etc., cetera, um, is by reducing consumption of those that consume the most, of reducing the consumption of the richest, and yet we quite also rely a lot 
on them for our ecotourism, for example, to come and to actually provide sort of more resources into spaces. So they're really interesting contradictions in how we've configured our systems. Um, and now I'm, so I'm going to pass over to Dr. Vasna Ramasar, who's hopefully going to solve, come up with some of the solutions, no pressure, that Jonathan was mentioning. Um, she is a scholar activist from South Africa who's currently based at Lund University in Sweden. She takes an interdisciplinary and holistic approach, approach to sustainability, bringing in perspectives from political ecology, ecological economics, not environmental no. economics, <laughs> um, and decolonial and feminist thought. She's worked across sectors, including at CSIR, the World Bank, the UNDP, and the Tata Group, as well as local and international NGOs and CSOs. Vasna, please take this. Thanks very much, Laura, and thank you, all of you. It's a delight to be here and to actually open up this conversation with such a rich uh, group of scientists and researchers. Um, I'm going to start from sort of connecting to a bit of where everyone else has spoken, and I have four points that I'd like to make. I think the first point is that we talk about this as a global crisis, as a global issue, as a global challenge, um, but you know, we do have to deconstruct the we in that and the Anthropocene and who is engaged. And we must see that from an African perspective, a lot of the decision making has been taken to the global level where we perhaps don't have as much political power as we would like to have. So uh, my starting point is that we need to think about what Africa needs in Africa's best interests, and not necessarily count on the fact that the international community will do so. That then takes me to the second point that I want to make, and relating to the theme of the panel, and I do offer a critique, um, and that's one of green growth, because I think it ties into the idea that we are trying to use the same tools, the same ideas, the same thinking, as Laura mentioned, to find the solutions. And I have a lot of concerns with that. One is that, and particularly for Africa, is that a lot of the green growth solutions that are being touted in the global north are ones that are dependent on resources, on labor, on embodied water, energy, land from the global south. Laura, you mentioned how the proliferation of um, electronic vehicles right, has huge consequences. The same in terms of wind turbines. It's not that there are simple solutions here, so we have to see the problems with some of these. In addition, we have a real risk of false solutions coming up. Um, we've seen that programs like Red Plus um, are really not actually benefiting the communities that they are meant to help, and they're not necessarily increasing or reducing emissions through that. So some of these solutions that are being put forward as green growth are really problematic, and we have to understand that. And at a more personal level, we also see that there is something called Jevons paradox, that people feel that if they do a few good things, that allows them to actually um, consume more, right? So actually thinking that you have better refrigerators means that we've seen a greater sale of refrigerators around the world. Those kind of contradictions come up in green growth and are not necessarily dealt with properly. So I have a concern with the green growth, so obviously I'm heading towards something else. And that brings me to the third point I want to make, is that growth should not be the primary economic objective, right? We actually need to think about what is it to have a good life? What is it to have a, a fulfilled life, to have, an, and, and I use the word happiness, but not in a superficial way, but what do we need for that? How do we think about what that life and lifestyle needs that changes the way we consume in the world? And then related to the earlier point, what does that mean for our relationship to the earth, to nature? How do we start to actually rebuild the rift that we have between society and nature? This is what we need to think about, not necessarily about prioritizing growth itself. So that then brings me to my last point, which is touching on the ideas of post-growth, degrowth, and alternatives. And I think that when we talk about this, there is a spectrum 
um, that relates to whether you're anti-capitalist or whether you actually see possibilities within the system that's about the changing the economic organization itself. I think there's very many ways that this can be addressed. So if I can try and give a little bit of, a, of the solution side to it, um, from the work that I've been doing, on the one hand, in terms of thinking about how we work, we actually need to rebuild those connections to nature, but we also have to build up our connections to each other. So things like thinking in a collective way, understanding the potential of commoning, uh, it's not just about having private property rights to protect things. Eleanor Ostrom, who won a Nobel Prize, showed that actually it can be done in a collective way. Um, some of the work I've been doing with the Potato Park in Peru has been phenomenal in showing how people can connect to this ritual, connect to the earth, connect to each other, um, protect the biodiversity of potatoes uh, from the Andes, and do that in a way that also ensures that they're food secure. Uh, there are examples where it is happening. Um, you talked about just transition, you talked about deep just transition. In South Africa, I'm working with women looking at what would be an African eco-feminist just transition building on all of these elements, but actually, again, thinking, what is it that we need? What is it that allows for the particular type of development that makes sense in our context? And again, coming to a point that Awanda made earlier, it's also thinking about this in a pluriversal way. There is no one size fits all, right? You know that from conservation. So how do we also think about that in how we're organizing our kind, the type of development that we have? From the other side of solutions, I think that if you want to think about how business can engage, there are ways that businesses are trying to uh, do post-growth, and that's about degrowth-adapted production, so finding ways that are actually adapted to what do we need to grow less? How do we find the right tools for that? And that, for me, also fits in with an African solution. It's not always about the high tech. It's not about doing solutions that are going to allow us to consume more. It's about doing solutions that allow us to consume enough. Right? Other solutions are around standard settings, degrowth-oriented standard settings. Companies like Patagonia, which have now moved to having only one shareholder, which is the planet, um, did also say that you can bring any of their products back in and they will help you to fix them. And it's not just Patagonia products, they would also help you with Nike and other brands as well. So there are ways as well that business are orienting in a way that can actually access a new market but one that is not about consumption. One is about changing how we tell the story. Um, I think going back to something that Nikki also said earlier on, you know, we're not thinking about conservation as the Disney version of it. I don't want to suggest that post-growth and degrowth and alternatives is a romanticized ideal. It is messy and complex, and there's a lot of politics in this. And so I think I just want to end by saying that the way that we actually put forward our African agenda is by having a collective African voice. So that's where we need all of you uh, who are in this room, who are doing very particular research, some of you, some of you are looking at the system as a whole, but how do we all think together to find different ways to understand what is a good life for people, for planet, for places? Thank you. Thank you so much, Vasna. I mean, so much about that. I mean, even just coming to this notion of, and I'm going to nerd out here, ecos, right? Meaning home, economy, ecology, actually fundamentally connected, and yet we've distantiated them so much in this post-enlightenment notion of nature there and, and society somewhere else. So about how do we rebuild these connections? Um, yeah, and I, and I think something that stands with stand me, and maybe this is something we can open up to, to the audience, is it, for example, very practically, sort of making planned obsolescence obsolete, right? This notion of that we can actually, we can fix things. It's largely how most of the informal economies, and we call them informal economies, but that are majority on the continent, actually function and sustain. It's fixing things. It's not consuming new things. So I think that there are definitely alternatives out there. But this is something that I'm also going to put to the panel to start noting before I um, pass on to the, um, onto the audience to give us some provocations that we can deal with. Um, 
you know, we spoke about it's messy and it's complex, these sorts of transitions. And yeah, a transformation is, is not easy. There are going to be winners and losers, and it's about sort of reconfiguring who those winners and losers are. But when we're looking at a situation, you know, where an African voice at the state level is largely captured, right? Not just in South Africa, but in, in many sort of countries because they're able to get the benefits at that level. And we know that sort of the richness, the resources that we have on the continent don't actually land up going to the people. Even Red Plus, for example, as you mentioned, you know. So, and this is, this is to Neva, but, but also to the rest of the panel. Is there actually any political will for these kinds of deep transformations? Because it means most of us actually losing out, actually reducing our consumption, not having the kinds of lifestyles that we've become accustomed to. Um, you know, you mentioned a wartime government. Is that the kind of radical reconfiguration we need? So putting that to the panel to sort of note down that, and I'd like to pass on to take questions from the floor. And I see Duncan has a microphone, so maybe he can, or someone, Rendani, or I can come down, but that's probably not going to help. Mm -hmm. Any hands? in the audience. Yes, there we go. Thank you. You asked for some provocative questions, so the audience must forgive me for this. <laughs> but we speak about how we manage and balance resources. And our conversation usually goes around the humanitarian aspect of it. And I think secondarily comes the planetarian. And by improving technology, improving food security, we find ourselves in a double bind. We have an increased population. So if you've got 8 billion people on the planet consuming 3,000 animals in their lifetime, we're not solving the problem. We're just kicking the can further down the road. It's like trying to get to the horizon. We're not going. Are we addressing certain things about human populations like we would address in any other ecosystem? I know it sounds very radical, but everything we look at is how do we protect human life and how do we expand human lifespans? But we find ourselves that we have an increasing need for resources. Okay, thank you. The population question always comes up, but I have my own very strong views on that, but an important um, aspect to bring in. And, you know, yeah, why is the planet secondary in that? But I'm sure my panelists are going to have, have fun responding to that. Um, there's another question there, and then I'll take one over here. I was going to put the suggestion to the panel that actually most of the problems that we're concerned with, whether it's climate change, population control, dealing with the Ukraine or fisheries or what you like, are actually the base problems of cooperation. They're problems of how we solve what economists call the tragedy of the commons, how we get a general agreement which is in everyone's average benefit, uh, but where there are benefits to other individuals to do the opposite to get a short-term benefit. So the basic problem I see is a problem of cooperation. I would actually rather disagree with Jonathan I think humans are actually quite good at, at cooperation. We cooperate to a greater extent with unrelated, commonly unfamiliar individuals than any other animal. But no animals that I know of have solved the tragedy of the commons. Species don't cooperate with each other when it is not in their direct interest to do so. They will always cheat on a deal if they can. And the problem that we face is that we need to enforce, the, to, to get the uh, international agreements that we'd like to make, which would increase average benefit. Uh, the problem that we face is how to enforce them. Thank you so much. And I'd like That's... to know how the panel suggests we enforce cooperative strategies uh, that are to everyone's average benefit uh, internationally. Thank you so much. And I think um, Eleanor Ostrom had quite a lot to say on cooperative governance and how it does actually work in, in some instances. But again, intergovernmental consensus-based decision-making is how we've largely structured our environmental decision-making um, ideas. I see a hand over there. Um, but that is quite often um, a race to the bottom in terms of where we can agree. So. Interesting. So we've got everything from population and putting the planet second down to cooperation and how, um, yeah, how we can, can do that better and actually leverage the fact that humans can actually cooperate. Um, I see one hand there and one hand there, and um, then I will return to the panel. Sorry, these lights are very bright. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
My question uh, or comment is directed to Dr. Ramisa. She spoke about programs that are not offering real solutions, and in particularly in Africa. So uh, when she's delivering this engagement, I'm enticed to think about uh, the usual concept uh, classified as uh, African agenda visa the global agenda. We are in the conference whereby we are speaking about uh, conservation and uh, wildlife protection. There were speakers that spoke about uh, having to conserve and protect some of the wildlife and making South Africa one of the examples to say at, uh, at the minimum with uh, larger animals, larger, larger wildlife, uh, it was in better uh, in terms of decrement and uh, extinctions. So they said, the speakers said that we must conserve uh, these animals so that we can be able to share uh, with the other countries and continents that are there, thereof. So, we are going back to the issues of African agenda and global agenda. Are we saying that the problems that we are having in Africa, Dr. Dr. Ramisa, are only centralized around Africa, the problem of unemployment, the problem of unemployment in relation to conservation? How are we saying that uh, the problem of uh, conservation in Africa is only Afri uh, affecting the unemployed of uh, Africa and the, uh, not the unemployed of Europe, the unemployed of China, the unemployed of all the sectors of the world. And I would like to say in my final uh, submissions to say, perhaps the crisis that we are having, uh, Dr. Ramisa, is not the, program, uh, the, the, the programs that are, are offering nothing or failing, but this uh, a, a crisis of policy failure uh, law failure, uh, which are disintegrated uh, in terms of ethics between the private sector and the government. So even if we are today here, uh, we've got researchers, we've got uh, individuals, members of the community, uh, but we do not have, we still do not have uh, those people who are going to be advocating and implementing these policies at which these researchers are producing and then uh, presenting to us. So it forces us to say, to look back and to reflect inwardly so, to say that we are going to suggest these uh, researches uh, to the government, but you'll find out that the government is still going to use the very same Mundas operandi that they've been, that they've been using for 15 years to, uh, ago. They're Thank still you. going to be repeating the very same thing because there's no uh, clear <coughs> integration between the research and the government and the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think, um, Vasna, you can sort of maybe clarify what you, you were meaning around an African agenda and, and, and Red Plus, but I think important questions around the science policy interface. I think this is largely a, a research conference, but how do we actually get not only research to decision makers, but them to action it? Because that relationship between business and government is something that you also pointed out as not necessarily addressing all of our, our issues. Um, another point over here. Uh, I know. Um, this is good evening, everyone. My name is Marilyn. I will start with a short question to maybe all the panelists in case I forget it and then I'll add a contribution or opinion I have. I wanted to ask, because we need change, um, how much radical change and how quickly can we achieve to stabilize the crisis with the environment? Because we need radical change, business as usual is not gonna serve um, the planet, it's not gonna save the planet. Um, I have an opinion about post or green growth uh, in, in the context of an African you know, development, I feel and I believe that we have to uh, create models for Africa to, de to ve develop in. And the word green is a very global word that may mean different things. You know, green economies, green energies, um, they exist in the ecosystem of the systems we are trying to move out of, which are, are capitalistic and exploitative. It can 
eventually just be a switch from the same models we had to just greenwashing or just upscaling the abuse of the environment by making farms basically of the solutions we're trying to. But for Africa, I think an Ubuntu growth model, because this word, I have to say, this opinion I have that we have minimalized, minimized the meaning of Ubuntu to say I am because you are minimizes the, the, the essence of the word. It's a, it's a recognition of life and it's a word used almost continent over and how it recognizes life. It even recognizes the life of inanimate objects because in most African languages, even in, inanimate objects seem to have a life yeah. because when your car breaks down, a lot of African languages say it has died not it's broken, it's a recognition of life. So an Ubuntu growth would be a model that recognizes life between biotic and abiotic systems and a, you know, an, an ecosystem-wide recognition of life and its dependence and its need to flow. Super. It wouldn't be, you know, it cannot Thanks. be taken over by whatever green and sustainable means to the rest of the world. So my question then to the panelists is, do we need growth or do we need a change, a radical change in what we think growth is? Thank you, and I think that's actually exactly the question that we were trying to unpack, so thank you for articulating it so well. And it's interesting, I had a conversation with Kate Rayworth a few weeks ago and she was mentioning how actually Ubuntu economics was something that we do need to start really thinking. So, so we need to take that conversation further. I know that some of our panelists need to leave. Um, we've got seven minutes left, so I'm going to hand back to Neva and work my way through um, in terms of responding to the comments and, and maybe actually giving the, the final closing thoughts um, that you have. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna have to leave as soon as I finished. Um, yeah, I just wanna say, I think really we're talking here about a couple of different things. And the one that's hardest is how do you build a coalition for change when we're facing a, a, a wicked problem? at a global scale them on and how do I get to a point where we can bring about real change and it does sometimes mean dirty compromises but um, that's what happens in a democracy is you need to have the majority on your side and preaching on the mountaintop often doesn't help no? thanks great have to run. thank I'm you no, no problem. Okay. That, that was that was super um, and, and maybe we can think a little bit more about what some of those dirty compromises might mean in practice. Um, well, it might mean, for instance, paying off coal companies. You know, in Germany, they are literally paying the coal companies to go away. Yeah. We can't afford to do that. Well, there we go. That, that <laughs> is one particular, very clear solution that, that we could put forward. Thank you so much, Neva, for joining us. Okay, so. Oh, one day. Um, so I'm just going to run through <clears throat> some of the questions, but I'll give a response which kind of melts all of them in together. Uh, and the first question was around population growth and resource consumption. Um, population growth is not a problem. Resource consumption is. Population, the question of population growth as being the problem is a hangover from the 20th century projections of the developing world and the way in which population was growing there. But if you look at a country like America, which is not included in that concept of being problematic with regards to growth in its population, but its consumption of resources, uh, requires more than one Earth, multiple Earths, to sustain the level of consumption that that country has. I mean, if you look at the population uh, growth figures of the world into the rest of the century, we're looking at it somewhat stabilizing by mid-century around 10 uh, billion. And then you could, you're seeing population degrowth happening in certain parts of the world, particularly such as Asia. Um, I mean, Africa, with its population of around a billion people, is a young it's a young continent, um, but the level of consumption on the African continent is nowhere near the level of consumption in America. So there's inequalities in resource consumption, and that's the problem that we have to face, which takes me to the next question with regards to cooperation, and I think the question is cooperation, how to enforce it, but I want to say how do we enable it? Um, and I think that there are, I agree, that hum human beings are a cooperative species. It's the only reason we've made it as far as we have. Mm -hmm. Societies, countries, governments, they're all experiments in cooperation. And what we require are new experiments in cooperation. We need alternative systems to the way in which we've constructed these societies. So I'm a member of the Climate Justice Charter Movement, which is an experiment 
in cooperation, but also thinking fundamentally with regards to the problems facing this country and this question that we're talking about right now, and the way in which our different communities, different perspectives, and our different backgrounds can find solutions towards addressing that. And it's also an, an experiment in challenging the constitution of this country, which has been lauded as being so forward-thinking as to really pushing it towards uh, uh, challenging its conception around the rights of nature and natural climate solutions with regards to how do we deal with these issues. Um, which is also then takes me to that question with regards to, I, I know it was for uh, Vasna, but just to touch on it in that, um, you know, protecting wildlife and ecosystems uh, also requires for us to uh, take into consideration the rights of nature and that the, part, the Constitution was go beyond just protecting nature uh, as a, you know, secondary uh, category of how we benefit from it. But there's been experiments, and you can see in, in, in Latin America, there's examples of where nature has been uh, protected at the level in which the Constitution protects human life. And I think that's the degree of thinking we need to go towards, which brings me to the last question with regards to how much radical change do we need growth or do we need to rethink growth? We need to scrap growth and we need to rethink well being. Um, and society as a whole into what is it that generates a, a, a healthy society. The concept of growth comes from a particular context within, with, uh, in and of itself. Uh, it comes from a period in the pre-war period in, in the 20th century and the post-war period with regards to being able to measure um, the level of production in, in an economy, and that's had a, a history and a legacy that has led to it being what it is. The 20th century, the 21st century, sorry, requires new experiments. It requires new conceptions of what constitutes a healthy society. It requires alternative solutions that are uh, that meet the challenge of our time, but also deepen cooperation in our society, and they deepen the interrelations that exist within a society, um, but not just between humans and people between uh, 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 divides, uh, inequality divides and class divides, but also between human and non-human life. Jonathan, next up. Uh, yep, and <laughs> uh, fundamentally, I think this idea, I, I stand ag against the idea of degrowth. Uh, I think that the vast majority of human beings live in their mind on the breadline. And if you take away their livelihood for the sake of the planet, they will revolt. And a people revolution against those that have or those that they perceive have is likely to end in catastrophe for mankind. Our planet will survive. That's, there's no doubt about that. There's no issue there. Uh, we're talking about our species survival here. And in terms of that, I fundamentally believe that we need to find a way to improve our people's well-being and you say this is a 20th century construct, well-being being measured uh, through economic prosperity, and in part you're right, but in part you're wrong. History has been about the accumulation of the necessary uh, paraphernalia to make one's life easier and better, and that's what we're talking about. In a world where people's lives are becoming more difficult, they are not cooperative. That is what human history tells us. In a world where their lives are improving, humankind is very cooperative. And that is the evidence of all written and pre-written history of humankind. I mean, you talk about what you're seeing in, in Peru. It's all about the community improving their all. Uh, in an environment where sections of that community are losing out, they rebel and compete against the remainder of the community. When the majority of the community are losing out, then you will have a human catastrophe. The critical thing is finding a way to create an easier world for human, humanity in a way that doesn't uh, prejudice the survival of our ecological system. That is the challenge. 
It's not about less growth, it's about a different form of growth which provides the goods and services in a way that allows mankind to prosper and grow, but at the same time ensures that our ecosystem is preserved. And if we fall back into a rhetoric of degrowth and the likes, I think we are, we're deluding ourselves into being trapped in this, this, this circular narrative where Einstein's expression comes back to my mind. I'm not going to go on. I'll just repeat myself. Before I give an answer, I'm not sure that I fully got the question that was directed to me on conservation. So hopefully we can have a chat afterwards about that if I don't answer it completely. Um, but then just a, a couple of points. Uh, well, no, maybe just one point. Um, and that point is that we have been told certain stories, certain narratives, certain discourses that have just become stuck in our minds and we have to break away from that. So population is not the problem, right? Consumption is. Uh, I think three years ago, it was one American child used the same resources as 32 children in India on an average, right? So we have to rethink that story. The tragedy of the commons, yes, I do think cooperation is something uh, that exists and is more likely to develop. I read a really interesting article that questioned this notion of fight or flight, and they looked at who were the participants in that research, and it was mostly male, and when researchers looked at it where they actually brought in a much di more diverse participant group, including women, they found that actually it was not always fight or flight, it was fight or befriend. So actually mm. find ways to cooperate in these instances of crisis. Now, that is me being hopeful about humanity, because yes, I would like us to continue to exist on this planet, and not just the planet itself, but also all the other species that we are taking to extinction with us. So I think that there are ways that this could happen differently, but we have to be open to other stories. And I think that Ubuntu, an African story, a lot of other ways, is also what needs to come up into the narrative and not just what we've been told as this one singular modern Western model. Great, thank you so much, Vasna. Um, we've heard a lot over the past hour. We've touched on everything from sort of a plurality of values that we actually hold for nature through to rights for nature, this idea of what does development actually mean in terms of meeting needs? Is it sort of just bare minimum around actually meeting calories, right? Food security, how, how, do our, how are our production systems set up? Um, we've heard about this idea of not just a just transition, but a deep just transition, and then a deep eco-feminist just transition. So we were sort of building up around that, and I think that this deep social ecological transformation, like how we actually organize ourselves, our governance systems, and our economies, is kind of sitting at, at the core of this, so that we are actually able to, to thrive. And I really like this word um, that Karen O'Brien uses. It's not about necessarily sustainability, but about thrivability, and we can thrive without sort of consuming more, right? I think we've actually seen um, studies that have shown that consuming more doesn't necessarily actually make us any happier, right? So what is, is it? Is it about that finding the connections between ourselves, between place, um, between, between nature, that is actually what we need to sort of go back to, and how can we drive that? And so I leave us all with this question that we can contemplate over what I think is gonna be a wine tasting after this. Um, is you know, what are our economies actually supposed to do? Are they just supposed to grow? Are they supposed to meet well-being? Are they supposed to actually steward and protect people and planet? Um, and, so, and, and if it's the latter, how do we actually need to reconfigure them? So thank you so much to my panel and to the audience, and I look forward to having, continuing this conversation. Sorry. Just before, just before everybody goes, um, I am asked to, uh, because we're running so late, the idea is that Derek and Beverly Joubert 
shortly are going to come up on stage and talk about some of their extraordinary experiences around the world and what they've been doing, and then show a film. But before that, and I don't think, Derek or Beverly, I should introduce you. you, you I think everybody here knows who you are and uh, in the interest of time. Before that, outside, and I really recommend out, get, come back here so that we can make up a little bit of time. Uh, we have Painted Wolf Wines, and we've, at the Oppenheim Research Conference, had a relationship with Painted Wolf, which goes back now, and I must get this right, to 29, no, 2018. And uh, they, they really helped us, and they've made an enormous contribution to conservation through a part of their, their wine uh, supporting conservation, particularly in South Africa. So they've very kindly given us wines to taste. I recommend we rush outside, we collect what we need, and we come back here as quickly as possible. 15 minutes? 15 okay. minutes, so at uh, 5 to 6, the f uh, Derek and Beverly will sing for their supper. <laughs>